If I 
I'm looking for my foot pedal for the piano. I'm like, where is it? <laughs> All right, we'll have modern and ancient here before us. All right, Jai Ma. All right, since I'm out of the loop and not normally reading along, I'm going to read my favorite story in the gospel tonight and talk about that. It was one that took me a long time. I think I'm still working on it, actually. It's taken me a long time to approach an understanding, and uh, I'm hoping that before it's time to shut things down in my life, that I understand these things. Do you remember the story of Bhagavati? She's the maidservant, no, no, not well, she was a maidservant, but she was, uh, she was a fallen woman, as it were, and uh, she came in to see the master and had a rather uh, incredible, um, I guess, meeting with him, with a bunch of devotees in the room. So I'm going to read it here, and I'll just stop when Mother stops me and say something, if there's something to say. After a time, Bhagavati, an old maidservant of the temple proprietor, entered the room and saluted the master from a distance. Sri Ramakrishna bade her to sit down. The master had known her for many years. In her younger days, she had lived, oh, a rather immoral life. But the master's compassion was great. Soon he began to converse with her. Master, now you're pretty old. Have you been feeding the Vaishnavas and holy men and thus spending your money in a noble way? <laughs> Bhagavati smiling. Ooh, how can I say that? <laughs> master, well, have you been to Vrindavan, Benares, and the other holy places? Bhagavati, shrinkingly, it says. How can I say that? Um, I have built a bathing place. My name is inscribed there on a slab. Master, indeed. Bhagavati, yes, sir, my name. Srimati Bhagavati Dasi. It's written there. The master with a smile, how nice. Emboldened by the master's words, Bhagavati approached and saluted him, touching his feet. Like a man stung by a scorpion, Sri Ramakrishna stood up and cried out, Govinda, Govinda! A big jar of Ganges water stood in the corner of the room. He hurried there, panting, and washed with holy water the spot that the maidservant had touched. The devotees in the room were amazed to see this incident. Bhagavati sat as if struck dead. So you see the scene here, it's quite a shocking one. I mean, this woman comes in. She's a fallen woman, you know, she had an immoral life, wasn't really strong in her, well, doesn't seem like she was strong in her spiritual life. She wasn't doing any pilgrimage or study of any kind, really. But she was visiting the master. And she felt all of that. I mean, who, who doesn't feel that? You know, you, you come into the temple and you can't leave part of your life. <laughs> outside the door. When you sit down in the shrine to meditate, you can't leave parts of your mind outside. To, and so you'll sit in the back, you know, sit in the back and kind of just hope, well, <laughs> maybe, maybe if the church doesn't fall on me, maybe he won't notice me kind of thing. And so she's sitting back there and, uh, you know, the master's asking her some questions and she's not doing real well uh, in passing the exam, as it were. And, you know, how can I say that? How <laughs> I'd like to say, you know, that I've been visiting, uh, giving things away to the holy people and taking care of holy men. I'd like to say that I've been on pilgrimage to these great places, but I can't. And, but I have, I have done something. <laughs> I, built, I helped build a bathing ghat on the Ganges there, and they even put my name on a plaque there. And it's written there, my name. So she's very, very happy about that. And the master is, you know, always encouraging. And this is so important to know about the nature of the divine. You can do squat. <laughs> you can do squat. And if you lift your little finger in the thought of God, the divine will be thrilled, will be jumping up and down, <laughs> will be so happy that the, the, the love of the beloved has done something for, for him, for her. 
And so she feels very emboldened with, when the master smiles and, and exclaims, how nice. And so she goes to salute him, to touch his feet, because she felt that, that beautiful sense of intimacy with the master, felt that certain amount of, of acceptance from the master. And so the room is full of devotees, and she gets up. Now is not so afraid and, and unsure, sitting at the back of the room. She gets up to come forward and to sit among the devotees and to touch the feet of her beloved master. And this horrible thing happens, this horrible thing. And I have wrestled with this, or did wrestle with this for years, you know, be <laughs> mostly. <laughs> Mostly because I remember one time when I was reading the gospel, uh, as, as part of my practice, I was sitting at the breakfast table with, with uh, Swami Prabhutananda, and he, and I was telling about what I was reading that morning. And that morning, he said, "Oh, very good." He said, "So tell me, have you found yourself in the gospel yet?" And I, I was like, "Excuse me, <laughs> Maharaj, what did you say?" He said, "No, did you find yourself in the gospel yet?" And I chuckled. I was like, Maharaj, why? <laughs> what, are you, what are you saying? Like, how, why would I find myself in the gospel at all? And uh, he smiled and he said, oh, I was just thinking, isn't it strange that you're here? Isn't it strange that you've come to the master? You know, you're an American living in San Francisco. And how is it that you ended up here in front of the master? Certainly there must have been something in a previous life. Perhaps you were in the gospel somewhere. And I always... I mean, I laughed at the idea, but I can tell you that, that from that day forward, <laughs> as I've read the gospel, I've been thinking, could I be that person? You know, that, that could be me. And I have to tell you, sorry as I am, <laughs> Bhagavati sounds about my par. You know, she's, <laughs> she seems to be doing exactly what I would have been doing in those days as I approached the master. And so it was very hard for me to see this reception, to see the master jump up in pain and to run across the room shouting, literally shouting God's name and panting. I mean, this isn't a subtle thing going on here. This is, he's in pain, jumps up, goes over and gets that jar of water and just dumps the whole thing on his feet and then comes back across. And I'm going to read the rest of that. There's more to say. Well, actually, I'll, we'll talk about this here. In this, uh, the fact that, uh, that the master felt this stinging, I always wondered, what is that about? I mean, how can the God of the universe who was surely there in the room when she was a fallen woman and was surely there when she cried her tears and surely there when she was born and surely there when in all of the intimate moments of our life that God has to witness those things when we're sitting there thinking nobody's watching, God has always been intimately with you, experiencing those things through you because after all, you are that right? You are the divine. And it is the divine that's experiencing your life before you do. We go to him as if we have to update him. Oh God, I had a really tough day today and blah, blah, blah. And we kind of give him the details. We leave out the, the sour ones, you know, and go on thinking, oh, I've had a great devotion. She was there. For every single bit of it, you dragged the mother of the universe through your entire play today, every day. So how is it that Ramakrishna can be stung like a scorpion when this intimate disciple comes forward and touches his feet? There has to be some meaning in this. This cannot be the way that it is, because certainly she is as much a child of the mother as anyone is. And if the love and rules of the Lord are grace and mercy and a love without condition, this does not fit. There's something being said here. And I wrestled and am wrestling, have wrestled with it for years. And this is the latest thing that when you think about it, this notion that thou art that. And who was Sri Thakur? Who was Ramakrishna? Ramakrishna was that hole through which God manifests, which God could be seen. He is the embodiment of your inner self. He is that manifestation which is you in the heart. 
He is who you will find when you touch that inner space, your spiritual center, your home, when you leave behind the body and mind and go within. That which is Takor is that which you will find there. Takor was showing her what her lifestyle, what her choices were doing to her inner self, to that beautiful self, that image of the beloved that is you. The amount of pain that we put that self through as we choose ideas of ignorance over the ideas of wisdom, when we choose the, the, the way to live where we are in charge, where we put the ego on the throne and we worship our body, you know, putting perfumes on it and hair products on it and dressing it in its nice clothes and, you know, shaving it and, you know, washing it, literally worshiping the body. And when we worship the mind, you know, trying to fix up its mood and give it what it likes and, you know, take it where it wants to go and let it see who it wants to see. We spend all of this time coddling this material aspect of ourselves and inside, Takur is literally screaming out in pain, screaming out in, 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 as our own self, not like we're hurting someone else. It's not that message, not like we're doing something that some picky god in the sky is going to get upset about and start you know, throwing lightning at you at random. It's, it's not that. This relationship between you and the beloved is between you and yourself. This relationship between you and God, the divine, is the relationship between you and yourself. And this coming to that notion of oneness within is when you become one person, when you become authentic, when you're no longer arguing with a conscience, when you're no longer arguing about whether you're going to do the right thing or not. At the time when you and your authentic self become one, when you realize God, at that moment, uh, you will have this meeting post Ganges water <laughs> with Takur. Because not only did Takur, yes, jump up and show her the embarrassment that she's in, in making the choices that she has made or continuing to make in her life, not only did he show her the pain that that is causing to herself, you know, the pain that causes us to need more and more distraction, the pain that causes the need for drugs, the need for alcohol, the need for friends, the need for vacations, that inner pain that we suffer, that we squelch and push down, that only comes up when we have that unfortunate experience of waking up in the middle of the night alone with all our defenses down and we're like, oh my God, <laughs> where am I? But Sri Ramakrishna consoled her and said in a very kindly tone, you should salute me from a distance. In order to relieve her mind of all embarrassment, the master said tenderly, listen to a few songs. This is the only woman that I know of. I want to be proved wrong, so prove me wrong. I think this is the only woman where that Takor, the only devotee that Takor sits down and sings a song for her, to her. So he has embarrassed her and caused her a great deal of shame in a large room. Actually, he didn't. He allowed her actions and her life and her decisions to cause her a great deal of embarrassment in this room. But now in order to alleviate that embarrassment, because that wasn't his point, his point was to wake up that awareness within. His point was to show her what she was doing to herself and to give her the motivation to turn away from that, to overcome that. So Sri Ramakrishna consoles her and says in a very kindly tone, you should salute me from a distance. In order to relieve her mind of all embarrassment, the master said tenderly, Bhagavati, listen to a few songs. And then the master sang about the Divine Mother. Listen to the song he chooses to sing to Bhagavati now. The black bee of my mind is drawn in sheer delight to the blue lotus feet of Mother Shyama's feet. Then he sang, high in the heaven of the mother's feet, my mind was soaring like a kite, when came a gust of sin's rough wind that drove it swiftly toward the earth. And finally, 
Dwell, O mind, within yourself. Enter no other's home. If you but seek there, you will find all that you are searching for. God, the true philosopher's stone, who answers every prayer, lies hidden deep within your heart, the richest gem of all. How many pearls, how many precious stones are scattered all about the outer court that lies before the chamber of your heart. So these beautiful words. So you have this fallen woman, embarrassed, shamed in front of a room full of devotees. And Takor comes in a kind voice to alleviate all of her embarrassment, showing her extra attention, making sure that everyone in the room sees this affection. And he sings to her, dwell, O mind, within yourself. Bhagavati, it's not that you're a bad person. It's not that you're a dirty person. It's that you're looking in the wrong place for who you are. Look deep within yourself. Don't enter any other home. Don't enter the, 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 the fantasies of the mind. Don't enter the desires of the body. Don't enter into this foreign land of the material that you live in. Don't go to anyone else's home. Dwell within yourself. And if you but seek there, you will find everything that you're looking for, Bhagavati. You'll find everything. It won't matter that you didn't visit the saints, that you didn't buy a hamburger for a homeless guy. <laughs> These things aren't what are going to matter. You will find all that you're looking for. God, the true philosopher's stone. What does that mean? The divine that can turn you into gold. The divine that can turn you into something precious that can take this life that you've lived, the mistakes that you've made, the suffering that you've encountered through ignorance, and turn it into gold, turn it into something valuable, turn it into something immense and powerful and beautiful. The God, this philosopher's stone, the one who answers every prayer, every prayer, God always says yes to your prayers. There's a catch. <laughs> he says yes to the degree that that prayer is prayed in combination with all of your prayers. And all of your prayers is the way you live. Every action that you take in a day is a prayer. If you go to the grocery store, it's a prayer for food. <laughs> If you get up early in the morning, it's a prayer for discipline, you know. If you pray to be rich and famous, but then you sleep through your audition, God takes the both of those and he'll give you the average. Well, let's see, she prayed for more sleep and she prayed to be rich and famous. Mm, let's put those both together. Okay, so you get as much fame and as much richness as sleeping through your audition earned you. <laughs> And so that's why many of our lives are so middle of the road, so uninteresting to us. It's because we're unfocused. We can't keep our track. We can't, we can't remember our prayers. We're not even conscious of our prayers. We're just living our life, you know, some happy little dog, <laughs> tongue hanging out, drooling, <laughs> running around, having no idea what we're praying for, what we're asking for, what we're going to get in return for our prayers. And so when you pray, pray with that single-mindedness. Know what you're praying for. Become aware. That is the whole point of living an aware life, a God-centered life, a conscious life, an authentic life. It's about knowing what you're praying for in everything that you do during your day. The ultimate of that is your karma yoga, where everything that you do is being done consciously as a prayer, as an offering, as worship to the beloved where every step of the day is a vocal prayer to God in a dance where you don't let go of that embrace for a minute, for a minute, to be conscious. If you but seek there, 
you will find all that you're searching for. God, the philosopher's stone who answers every prayer, lies hidden deep within your heart. The richest gem of all, the most valuable thing in life is to be found in you. It's your ability to know love. It's your ability to give love. It's your ability to learn from your mistakes. It's your ability to get up and try again. It's your ability to recognize the love of the divine and to trust that everything is fine, that, that, that mercy has covered you, that an unconditioned love has lifted you up, and that you have the world's greatest fan jumping up and down in the stands just because you happen to remember her today because you remembered to think of God for a moment, jumping up and down this largest and richest gem of all within you, the very image of God that you are. And this life that, that Bhagavati has lived that has caused her so much shame and so much suffering, he's telling her now it's never too late. It's never a problem. It's always fixable. You can always get up and go again. And those times when you don't believe in yourself because you've fallen to the same error three million times and you're sitting there and you can't even bring yourself to pray, oh God. <laughs> and you sorely think that you shouldn't go to the shrine or you sorely can't possibly walk into, the, into your, uh, you know, your shrine to pray or to meditate because you're like, oh God, how can I walk in here looking like this? How can I walk in here knowing what I know? And God says, come here, let me sing a song to you. Let me tell you about yourself. Come in here and know that I have it all covered. I've answered all your prayers. I'm listening to every word of your heart. I am the philosopher's stone. I will turn you to gold. Come and sit, bring yourself as you are, and let's get to work. Because love always hopes, always believes, right? I mention that all the time from 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 8. God, you know, it says that love always hopes, always believes, always trusts. Love never fails. And God is that love. He believes you when you don't believe you. He trusts you when you don't trust you. When you've made the same mistakes over and over and you think, I'm never going to get never going to fix this. <laughs> this. This is a permanent flaw. He's like, no, I believe you're going to overcome it. I know you will. The richest gem of all, how many pearls and precious stones are scattered all about. They're everywhere in there. Begin that practice in earnest. Sit with the beloved with a sincerity and an earnestness. And to the degree that you can manage and muster that sincerity to the degree that you can manage that earnestness. To that degree, your journey is shortened and quickened to arrive at home. In that same degree, God moves forward, full of grace. Scattered all about are these precious pearls and stones, the outer court that lies before the chamber of your heart. So it's not only the things you're going to see when you get the, the Big Bang, <laughs> you know, when you realize God, when you have your realization. That's not the only stone down there. That's not the only precious gem. There's thousands of these things in there. The way that your relationships will be when you learn to love, when you learn to not be an ego, when you learn not to be offended. How your work is going to go when you learn to do it for worship's sake in the moment, fully focused on God. How your relationship in the office is going to be as a cubicle rat when you come to realize and understand the reason you're there is for love. To love, to love, and to love some more. When you understand that all the labels society puts on you have nothing to do with the human that you are. That you, you will love. You will care. You'll become a master of compassion. So that's the story of Brighu, the story of her song from the master. The next day, Tuesday, June 5th, 1883, 
Rakal and Hazra were staying with the master in the temple garden at Dakshineshwar. M2 had been there since the previous Sunday. As it was a weekday, there were only a few devotees in the room. Generally, people gathered there in large number on Sundays or holidays. It was afternoon and Sri Ramakrishna was telling the devotees about his experiences during the God-intoxicated state. Now, there's a time you might want to be there. <laughs> Thakur, Thakur is sharing these things. You know, it's amazing because there, I spent a lot of years really, especially thinking along the ideas that what if I was there? What if I was a part of that? And then kind of bemoaning the fact that like, how can God ask all these things of me and I haven't even seen them? You know, it's like... It's like these guys, I, you know, when I first when I first read the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna and saw just on every page, somebody was in ecstasy. Every page was somebody was having a vision of the mother, you know, some, everywhere. It was like all this stuff was going on. And I, I joined the monastery, you know, like five weeks after I first read that. I, I was like, sign me up. I'm in here. Let's do this, you know. And I remember for that first solid two years in the monastery, it was one of the most wonderful things in the world because I believed every time I sat down for meditation that that could be the moment. I sat down every day, and when I started to meditate, I sat there sometimes quite a bit longer than I do these days because I really earnestly thought this could happen. And I bemoan the fact now that I don't feel that way that I've grown calloused in that way. Because the truth of the matter is, every time you sit could be the moment. Mother says, every time she says that you'll get it at some point, she always says, you can have it now, if you want it. You can have your enlightenment now, if you give up all desire. It's not a matter of time. It's not a matter of having to work or accomplish or get something done. It's a matter of being willing to, res to, to, to surrender, to give it all up, all the way down, and sit before the, the beloved. So he's sitting here, and he's talking to the devotees like this, and we think, oh, well, if I was there, you know, then I'd realize God too, right? But think of the advantage that we have. Do you think that these people in the room saw any of the complete works of Vivekananda? Could they go home and pick up volume eight and sit there and read about the teachings of Vivekananda, read his lectures in America? Could they go and, and uh, you know, pick up the gospel? Could they go and pick up the life of Brahmananda, the eternal companion? Could they pick up any of the dozens of books that we have that tell us the whole story? We know who Thakur was. Why? Because his name has gone around the world. It hadn't even broken the lines of Dakshineshwar at that point. How would you think that this simple little priest there on the cot was God? How would that occur to you, having no idea what would become of Vivekananda and Brahmananda and the order that hadn't even formed yet at this point? It would have been no advantage to, well, that's not true at all. <laughs> well, there was, I could get away with that one, no. It would have been a great advantage to be there. <laughs> and we might have re realized God in that moment. But we certainly have so many more tools available and so many things to really celebrate in, in spiritual life nowadays. Because we know Thakur without having to make time to run to Dakshineshwar to sit there for an hour and hear just one of these stories or witness just one of these teachings. Now we can pick them up anytime we want and be immersed in the presence of the beloved. And now we know that Thakur wasn't just a man working at, at, at an old temple, that Thakur is the manifestation of our inner self. We know that that's accessible now, that if we can just quiet the mind, let go of our attachment to the body and go before the mind, go deep within in the silent spaces, the spaces where there is no space-time causation, that inner world where there is no time, where there is no life and death, there's only isness, that at any moment we can go there and we can sit with Thakur and we can remember and hear the faint whisper of these stories. The master says, oh, what a state I passed through. At that time, I didn't eat my meals here. I would enter the house of a Brahmin in the village or at Baranagor or at Aryadaha. Generally, it would be past mealtime. 
I would just sit down there without saying a word. If the members of the household asked me why I had come, I would say, I want something to eat. <laughs> now and then I would go uninvited, of course, to Ram Chatterjee's house at Alambazar or to Chudari's or at Dakshineshwar, but I didn't relish the food at the Chudari's house. <laughs> you see the master, just how simple he was. He'd just walk into their house, wouldn't even, none of the social niceties, none of the, none of, I mean, none of them. <laughs> he just walks in, sits at the table, and if they came in, it would be like, why are you sitting at the table? <laughs> he would just feel like, I want something to eat. <laughs> and sure enough, there it was. Just such a wonderful, straightforward, simple human being. One day I begged Matur to take me to Devendra Tagore's house. I said, Devendra chants the name of God. I want to see him. Will you take me there? Matur Baba was a very proud man. How could one expect him to go to another man's house uninvited? At first he hesitated, but then he said, all right, Devendra and I were fellow students. I'll take you there. Another day I learned of a good man named Dina Mukherjee living in Bug Bazaar near the bridge. He was a devotee. I asked Matur to take me there. Finding me insistent, he took me to Dina's house in a carriage. It was a small place. The arrival of a rich man in a big carriage embarrassed the inmates. We too were embarrassed. That day, Dina's son was being invested with the sacred thread. The house was crowded and there was hardly any place for Dina to receive us. We were about to enter a side room when someone cried out, please don't go into that room. The ladies are in there. <laughs> it was really a distressing situation. Returning, Mathur Babu said, Father, I will never listen to you again. I laughed. Oh, what a state I passed through. Once Kumar Singh gave a feast to the sadhus and invited me too. I found a great many holy men assembled there. When I sat down for the meal, several sadhus asked me about myself. At once, I felt like leaving them and sitting alone. I wondered why they should bother about all of that. The sadhus took their seats. I began to eat before they had started. I heard several of them remark, Ooh, what sort of man is this? <laughs> so you see, he was just who he was. Just who he was. That he didn't have that feeler out there, you know, like I do, like many people do. Oh, what's this person going to think? Or what are those people going to say? Or will that cause a scene? Will it be a problem? You know, all of those things. Like, I can't even walk out of the monastery without my hair combed. You know, it's like, that's, that's the state of this. And I read this and see what a freedom. What a man just being authentic, just being who he is, just on his own terms in the world, in love with the mother felt invited always because everyone was his own, even if they didn't know it, <laughs> even if they had no idea. He assumed that intimacy. He assumed that friendship. What a wonderful marker that is for us to assume friendship first, to assume confidence first, to assume welcome first, to live life that way, knowing that we are in mother's playground that we are in mother's house, that we are seeing mother's face in every face. The world will be very different for us when we begin to le learn that lesson, to see that, because you'll put off a completely different energy for who you are. People will talk to you on the street. People will share their stories and show you pictures of their kids on the bus. <laughs> These things will begin to happen. You'll feel that, that, that camaraderie with the world of strangers. Because like mother, you will have learned to make the whole world your own. No one is a stranger, my child. Learn to make this world your very own. It was about five o'clock in the afternoon and Sri Ramakrishna was sitting on the steps of his veranda. Hazra and Rakal and M were near him. Hazra had the attitude of a Vedantist, I am he the master to Hazra. Yes, all one's confusion comes to an end if one only realizes that it is God who manifests himself as the atheist and as the believer, as the good man, 
and as the bad man, the real and the unreal, that it is he who is present in waking and in sleep, and it is he that is beyond all of these. There was a farmer to whom an only son was born when he was rather advanced in age. As that child grew up, his parents became very fond of him. One day the farmer was working in the fields when a neighbor told him that his son was dangerously ill, indeed at the point of death. When he returned home, he found the boy dead. His wife wept bitterly, but his own eyes remained dry. Sadly, the wife said to her neighbors, such a son has passed away and he hasn't even shed a single tear. After a long while, the farmer said to his wife, do you know why I'm not crying? Last night I dreamed I had become a king. I was the father of seven princes. They were beautiful. They were virtuous. They grew in stature and acquired wisdom and knowledge in all of the various arts. Suddenly I woke up. Now I have been wondering whether I should weep for those seven children or for this one boy. To the Gyanis, the waking state is no more real than the dream state. God alone is the doer. Everything happens by his will. So you see the depth of this understanding that everything is a thought. Does that ring a bell? Everything is a thought. We think that's a table and we think it's separate, but it's not a table. It's your thought about a table that you've interpreted from some neurological impulses that have come into your mind in the dark cranium of your head. And your mind has showed you what it has conjured together as the symbol for a table. This table is only a thought. You do not know what's really there. You don't know where that information's coming from. That light, just a thought. You're not seeing that light when you look at it. How is that light getting to the brain? It's not. That light is being encoded into neurological symbols and being passed along the nerve to a section of the brain that takes it, interprets it, and says, okay, how are we going to describe that? <laughs> how are we going to show that to the soul? And it creates a symbol for a light. And there's your symbol. Everything in your world is a thought and only a thought. There's nothing real about it. If one boy dies in the waking state and seven boys die in the dreaming state, to the Gyani, there's no difference. They were all equally a thought. Your idea of who you are is just a string of thoughts that you've held on to and added together. I'm this, 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 and this. I'm not this, this, and that. I like this, I don't like that. I want this, I don't want that. And that cluster of limitations and restrictions, Swamiji says, that's who you are. That's your thought about yourself. Just a selection of a few restrictions and limitations. This infinite self that you are, you've narrowed it down to just one gender. You've narrowed it down to an age. You've narrowed it down to a job type, to a set of things you like and don't like. But at the end of the day, you yourself are just a collection of thoughts that you've had about yourself. They aren't real. They aren't true. They aren't permanent. They will change. And you should give yourself permission to change them in the snap of a moment when you see that they aren't serving you well. To the Ghanis, the waking state is no more real than the dream state. God alone is the doer, and everything happens by his will. That brings in a lovely idea of faith and living this fearless life. Vivekananda says that religion begins in fear but ends in love. Why? Because we come to know that the nature of everything is love. The nature of every thought you've had is love. The nature of every idea that you've had is love. 
And when we come to know the nature of love itself and what that means about everything that we experience and everything that we love and everything that we want, when we come to know that, what a fearlessness overtakes us when we come to realize we're not giving up anything when we renounce. We're just stopping the nonsense. We're not walking away from anything but a pile of thoughts that we've had, a pile of ideas, a few scattered experiences that we've reinterpreted, forgotten the original and rewritten a thousand times in the years that we're around. God alone is real, all else is changing. Hazra, but it's very difficult to understand that. Take the case of the sadhu of Bukhailas, how people tortured him and in a way killed him. They had found him in Samadhi. Well, this is a story. This is an unbelievable story. <laughs> so you have this sadhu, he's in Samadhi, okay, which means he's in ecstasy. He's, he's, he hasn't totally, right? you can like, Taco was in ecstasy and the doctor went and touched his eyeball and there was no flinching of the eye or anything. So that's the state of this sadhu. And it says, they found him in Samadhi. First they buried him. <laughs> thinking that he was dead, right, I guess. Then they put him under water, and then they branded him with a hot iron. So apparently they're trying to wake him up. I don't know, why would you do this to somebody? Does anybody know? Oh, look, that guy's not moving, let's bury him. No, 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 let's, let's dunk him in the water. No, 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 let's brand him. Like I read this story the first time, I was like, who are these people? <laughs> these are not my neighbors. So they branded him with a hot iron. Thus, they brought him back to con consciousness of the world. Okay, so it worked, right? They brought him back to the consciousness of the world, but listen to this. But in the end, the sadhu died as the result of these tortures. You know, <laughs> it's like your father getting you out of bed by beating you to death. I mean, what's going on here? He says, thus they brought him back to consciousness of the world, but in the end, the sadhu died as, as a result of these tortures. He undoubtedly suffered at the hands of men, though, as you say, he died by the will of God, the master. Now, this is a pretty hard line the master's taking here. The master, man must reap the fruit of his own karma. But as far as the death of that holy man is concerned, it was brought about by the will of God. The Kavirajas prepare Makaradvaja in a bottle. What is that? An Indian medicine made of mercury and sulfur, in the preparation of which gold acts as a catalytic agent. Okay. So they prepare, they prepare this in a bottle. The bottle is covered with clay and heated in the fire. The gold inside the bottle melts and combines with other ingredients, and the medicine is made. Then the physicians break the bottle carefully and take out the medicine. When the medicine is made, what difference does it make whether the bottle is preserved or broken? So people think that the holy man was killed, but perhaps his inner stuff had been made. After the realization of God, what difference does it make whether the body lives or dies? That shows you how little we know. <laughs> that shows how little we know. We are so concerned about the God, about the body and about the mind that we read that story there and we're like, ah, ah, there's no explanation that's acceptable for that. <laughs> there's no way that that's okay. And then Takor talks. He's like, look, the body's gonna go anyway. That guy wasn't gonna live forever. That body wasn't gonna go on forever. What's the value in a body? They come and go, it's material. The last I heard, I think uh, it was in a science class, eighth grade, I won't go into the math of how long ago that was, but the, apparently in, in all of your body, there's $23.71 worth of materials. <laughs> like 70% of your body's water. So you know, on the, on the purely capitalistic scale, what's the body? $23, you know, in 1970s money. <laughs> Who cares if it dies or not? So Takor is making the point. Get a different perspective that's not based on the body when you think about life. Get a different perspective that's not based on mind when you start wondering how can the world be this way. Stop thinking that you know better because you have a body and you have a mind fully based on material ideas. Stop thinking that you can blame God for all the horrible things that are happening because you have no idea what's important. You have no idea. 
about the depth of the love of the divine and what he is accomplishing and the fact that no price is too high for him to bring you home, to teach you what you have to be taught, to show you what you have to see in order to be willing to renounce, in order to be willing to let go, in order to muster in yourself a surrender so complete it includes your very sense of I. God will do anything for you to bring you home. Your body may hurt. Your mind may be offended. You may think the whole world has abandoned you, but God never abandons you. Every single thing you suffer has a motive of love in a promise of the divine to bring you home. The pain we feel is our attachment. Our attachment is our refusal to learn our refusal to pay attention to what works and what doesn't work in life. Man must reap the fruit of his own karma, but what difference does it make whether the body lives or dies? The sadhu of the Bukhalas was in samadhi. There are many kinds of samadhi. My own spiritual experiences tally with the words I heard from a sadhu of Rishikesh. Sometimes I feel the rising of the spiritual current inside me as though it were a creeping of an ant. Sometimes it feels like the movement of a monkey jumping from one branch to another. And again, again, sometimes it feels like a fish swimming in water. Only he who experiences it knows what it is like. In samadhi, one forgets the world. When the mind comes down a little, I say to the Divine Mother, Mother, please cure me of this. I want to talk to people. None but the Ishvara Kotis can return to the plane of the relative consciousness after attaining samadhi. Yes. So that's important to know. There's many people in the world today claiming to take to, to, to have samadhi. I went to, I was in North Carolina one time in Raleigh giving a lecture, and someone who came to the lecture that day said, Oh, we're having an Advaitic um, Vedanta meeting at this house tomorrow, would you like to come? And I was like to, I, I, and they were like, yes. And uh, I said, what, what are you doing there? And they said, well, we have several speakers. And I said, oh, uh, who are the speakers? And he told me, I said, and I said, how do you choose your speakers? And he says, we only let people who have had, who've experienced Samadhi give, give our lectures. I thought, wow, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> that means dead people are giving your lectures. You know, because normal people, if you have samadhi, the scriptures are saying if you're not Ishvara Koti, and Ishvara Koti means one of these, uh, like the bodhisattvas, they come with God whenever God, like the 12 disciples of Jesus. Actually, I think there were 16 disciples of Jesus in reality. Or the men uh, and women who surrounded Thakur Ramakrishna when he came, or the men and women that surrounded Buddha when he came. Those are the Ishvara Kotis, and they come each time. You know, you'll read in the gospel several times where the master is saying, oh, you were with Krishna. Oh, you were one of Jesus's disciples. You know, that these, these folks keep coming back. The ish, the, 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 uh, <laughs> God, I'm getting old. What's that word? These avatars. <laughs> There's no S on avatars. There's one avatar. It's always God coming. God without a personality. God without all of the attachments and, and whatnots. That's why Thakur describes himself as the hole through which God can be seen. Because God's not a personality. God doesn't come as Jesus. God doesn't come as Buddha. God, God just comes. And we call him Buddha. We call him Jesus. We call him Rama. We call him Krishna. And after that Rama or that Krishna or that Buddha has enlightenment, us goofballs are still calling him Buddha, still calling him Rama, still calling him Krishna, when he himself has abandoned the body, has no identity with it whatsoever, doesn't care at all what happens to it. And we're still running around, oh, Ramakrishna, oh, Ramakrishna, oh, Holy Mother. And she's like, I'm in here. <laughs> I'm in here. What are you doing? I'm in here. You know, so it's, it's, to understand that point is very important, that the avatar is one, you know, that he comes. We give him the names. And when he goes, he doesn't go. He returns back to the heart, <laughs> you know, as if he ever left. 
So you want to find Ramakrishna, this is where you'll find him. You want to find Jesus or Buddha or Rama, this is where you'll find him, her, that, within your own self. None but the Ishvara Kotis can return to the plane of relative consciousness after attaining samadhi. Some ordinary men attain samadhi through spiritual discipline, but they don't come back. But when God himself is born as a man, as an incarnation, holding in his hand the key to others' liberation, that's the difference between an Ishwar Koti and our, or not, well, Ishwar Koti, yeah, but certainly the avatars and ourself, you know, it's that, it's just a difference in power between us. You know, it's a difference in power, like the difference in the amount of clay in a mouse, and, in a clay mouse or a statue of an elephant. You know, they're both made of stone or clay, but different amounts of it. We're all manifestations of the power of God. Some a little, some a whole bunch. And a Thakur or a Buddha or a Jesus is a whole bunch of it so that he has the power to literally free you, which is why we come, which is why we build this relationship with the beloved. holding in his hand the key to others' liberation. Then for the welfare of humanity, the incarnation returns from samadhi to the consciousness of the world, M to himself. Does the master hold in his hand the key to man's liberation? You see, for us, in, in our context, we're like, duh. <laughs> That's why his name's all around the world. That's why he's got temples everywhere. But you remember at this point, he has no temples to him. At this point, there's nothing. He's just, he's just this simple old guy that shows up at people's houses wanting food, you know, <laughs> expecting to get it. And for the first time, it's occurring to M. He's like, oh my gosh, who am I sitting in front of? Who, 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 who have I stumbled upon here? This man has the power to free me. Hazra. The one thing needful is to please God. What does it matter whether an incarnation of God exists or not? It was the day of the new moon, and gradually the night descended and the dense darkness enveloped the trees and the temples. A few lights shone here and there in the temple garden. The black sky was reflected in the water of the Ganges. The master went to the veranda south of his room. A spiritual mood was the natural state of his mind. A spiritual mood was the natural state of his mind. The dark night of the new moon associated with the black complexion of Kali, the Divine Mother, intensified his spiritual exaltation. Now and then he repeated, Om, and the name of Kali. He lay down on a mat and whispered to M, Yes, God can be seen. A person has had a vision of God, but don't tell anyone about it. Tell me, which do you like better? God with form or the formless reality? M. Sir, nowadays I like to think of God without form, but I'm also beginning to understand that it is God alone who manifests himself through different forms. Master, will you take me in a carriage someday? to Mati Seal's garden house in Belgaria. When you throw puffed rice into the lake there, the fish come to the surface and eat it. Oh, I feel so happy to see them sport in the water like that. That will awaken your spiritual consciousness too. You will feel as if the fish of the human soul were playing in the ocean of Satchit Ananda. In the same manner, I go into an ecstatic mood when I stand in a big meadow. I feel like a fish released from a bowl into a lake. Spiritual discipline is necessary in order to see God. I had to pass through very severe discipline. How many austerities I practiced under that bell tree. I would lie down under it crying to the Divine Mother, O oh, Mother, reveal yourself to me. The tears would flow in torrents and they would soak my body. M, you practice so many austerities, but people expect to realize God in a moment. Can a man build a wall simply by moving his finger around his home? The master with a smile. 
Amrita says that one man lights a fire and ten bask in its heat. I want to tell you something else. It is good to remain in the plain of the Leela after reaching the Nitya. M. You once said that one comes down to the plain of the Leela in order to enjoy the divine play. Master. Oh, no, not exactly that. The Leela is real, too. Let me tell you something. Whenever you come here, bring a trifle with you. Perhaps I shouldn't say it. It may look like egotism. I also told Adar Sen that he should bring a pennyworth of something with him. I asked Bhavanat to bring a pennyworth of beetle leaf. Have you noticed Bhavanat's devotion? Narendra and he seem like man and woman. He is devoted to Narendra. Bring Narendra here when you come in the carriage, and also bring some sweets with you. It will do you good. <laughs> All right, so that's our beloved master there, talking freely with the devotees, going into ecstasy and trying to tell them what it is. And tonight he shared it with us. So severe austerities. Of course, he said you only have to do one sixteenth of that. We get our we get our food by faith and grace. And we live a holy life in response to knowing that grace. We will, we will find God because God has revealed himself to us in that perfect love. And so we sit and we meditate to enjoy that love, knowing that Takwar has done the work for us. And so, uh, and so we go. Are there any questions? Or... So in the <laughs> so in the story you mentioned at the beginning of Bhagavati, um, first you read the first part, and it made me think that oh Thakur could have oh there I was thinking of a scene where. Um, Thakur is really forgiving her or something, but other people are saying, oh, she's bad. You know, that's how Thakur's setting an example. But then Thakur did something else, right? Thakur humiliated her almost in front of everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then you explain why Thakur did that. But that reminds me of uh, um, M, the writer of the Gospels, first experience with Thakur, right? Mm -hmm. He was also shamed in front of Ramlal. Oh, yes. do you get married? You have kids? All these things. So it seems like a pattern in Thakur, right? Thakur will ask some questions, let your ego come out, <laughs> then break it down, make you a devotee afterwards, then comes the grace part. Yes. So, but it was a really beautiful verse. That, I remember now I heard the story, but I didn't... I felt like, oh, why would Thakur do that? I was expecting a Jesus-type situation. Oh, have anyone here died, did an immoral action? Right. Mm -hmm. Let he who is out sin cast the first stone. Yeah. yeah. Well, that it is a repeating pattern. <laughs> Absolutely. Because God is offering you infinite mercy. You cannot accept infinite mercy if you don't have infinite humility. If you come to God thinking that you have even one thing worthwhile, that's one thing God can't give you. So he has to remove the entire ego from you. And he, she, that will do anything to do that. And that is what this world is. It's an ego-busting machine. <laughs> you know, monasteries in particular are ego-grinding machines, you know. <laughs> so yes, it is a repeating pattern because we have the same disease, egoism. And we have to, we have to be willing to let go. We have to come to an absolute surrender. And if we're not able to do that, we can't have the infinite grace. So it's well worth the effort to realize that God is the doer and that we are just the machine. 
the thing that makes you valuable is the image of the beloved within you, not what you're doing with it, not what you've accomplished with it, not any delusional story of adjectives that you've put together to describe yourself. Your value is the value of, of the divine within you. That's all that you have to offer. And what is that to God? It is him very, his very self. What does he need from you? He wants you. That union is your natural state. It is the desire <laughs> of the universe for that unity to happen, for that harmony to happen, for that reuniting to be recognized. But it can't, like Mother says, is if there's even one little, th little fiber, fiber that's, that's the word, <laughs> one little fiber sticking out of the thread, it can't go through the eye of the needle, you know? Now that's not a problem for God. He can put camels through the eye of a needle. So what's the problem? He's not just trying to get it through the eye of the needle. He wants you to come home. He wants you to enjoy infinite mercy, infinite love. He wants you to do the homework to find out what unconditioned love means and understand that the brightest light in you is what is revealed when you surrender everything that's blocking it everything that's locking it up in you. And as long as you identify with that, that ego, that mind, that body, it's going to hurt. But it's a sweet hurt. It's a hurt that ends in healing. That, that brings you to authentic. Any other questions? All right. Well, go in God's grace. Humble yourself <laughs> and, and be happy. <laughs> Jai Ma, Jai Takor, Jai Swamiji, Jai Jeet.